Good evening, everybody. I hope you heard the intro music just there. Um, I've kind of changed up how I do the intro music, so um, hopefully um, you could hear it because uh, I've rerouted the audio for the music player. So I have been using the music player inside of Studio One in the browser, but um, now I'm doing it slightly differently, so I hope you heard that uh, so that I don't have to just open Studio One just to do the intro music. It just seems a bit silly to me to have to do that, but there we go. Uh, <laughs> so please do say if you heard it, and just Bob said he's, it sounded good. Well, that's great. So that worked. Excellent. That means I can do this without having to open Studio One just to do the intro music. Uh, we will open Studio One if we have Studio One related questions throughout the course of the show. Um, but yes, welcome to the February 9th, 2020 edition of Sunday Night Live. Uh, it's been a heck of a week. <laughs> Ken says sounded fine. Excellent. Yes, it's been a heck of a week here. Um, first of all, the middle of the middle of last week, Wednesday to be precise. Um, if you've been following me on Facebook, excuse me. If you've been following me on Facebook, you will have seen that I posted up um, that my my kids' primary school uh, was on fire on Wednesday. And uh, so Thursday and Friday just totally went out the window because the school was shut because of the fire that happened on Wednesday. Um, about half past three in the afternoon, um, the fire began and it was not extinguished until half past nine on Thursday morning um, with fire crews uh, tackling the blaze throughout the course of the night, and then they spent the rest. They spent the whole of Thursday um, extinguishing hot spots so that the fire wouldn't reignite. And uh, pretty much, damage is pretty extensive. Um, early reports were that five of the classrooms in the school were completely destroyed, and a section of the roof had caved in. We now know that it was more like 13 classrooms that were completely destroyed, uh, which is essentially a whole wing of the school completely destroyed. Um, and as I say, with a section of the, the roof collapsed. So uh, it's been a very unsettling time for my kids because they're quite concerned about what's been destroyed, what hasn't been destroyed, and uh, all of that, and um, not knowing kind of when they're going to be going back to school. So, uh, it's been very unsettling for them, and they've been quite troubled by the whole thing. Um, everyone got out of the school absolutely fine. Um, the fire uh, started just after the school day had ended, so there were just like um, after-school clubs that were running in the school at the time, um, and they safely evacuated out of the building and uh, went to the nearby uh, community center, and... Uh, were picked up by their parents from there. So all the kids are fine. Their classrooms aren't. <laughs> so um, my kids have been really quite upset and quite disturbed by the whole it, the whole thing, really, the whole experience. So Thursday and Friday, my kids were at home with me. And so I basically had to just abandon any thoughts of doing any work for, for Thursday, Friday. So that is why there have been no videos put out this week. I ha I was going to do um, the second splitter video this week, and I've not been able to do it. So um, that will happen this week. I will get that out this week. Um, my kids are off uh, for a week now. Uh, so no school for them for, for the whole of this coming week. Uh, and then the plan is that they will be going to... Um, all the, the whole um, population of, of my kids' school will be sent to four different schools um, for the remainder of um, uh, this half of, of term. So all the way up until the Easter vacation, they will be in four different schools. Um, fortunately, um, my son and daughter, who are on, who are in different different year groups, different classes. Um, they will be going to the same place, which has settled me a little bit because the whole thing has been really quite 
uh, unsettling for everybody and quite traumatic. So, um, so they will be going to the same place. They're not going to be separated, which is great. And their friends are going to be there as well. So that's a really good thing in the midst of everything else. So, um, so after the Easter vacation, um, they will be coming back to the school grounds, to the school site, but the entire population of the school will be accommodated in temporary buildings, which will be kind of set up um, a little bit away from the main school building. And then I imagine what will happen is when we get to the summer vacation, um, I imagine that the school will be bulldozed and a new school will be built. That's what I'm thinking is going to happen, but we will know a little bit more when we get to when we get to that point. Um, and, you know, this whole kids being in different schools starts working, I guess, then, you know, there'll be a bit more of a plan. So, yeah, it's been quite unpleasant uh, experience this last week. And so my kids have been struggling to sleep at night um, because they're really quite concerned about, where, you know, where they're going to be going and, and all of that and how it's all going to work out. So not been much fun for me either because I've not been getting a whole lot of sleep. So, uh <laughs> So there you go. So that's that's kind of the news here uh, at uh, at Johnny Lipscomb Studios. So I apologize for not getting the, the next Splitter video out because I know you guys have been waiting for that. Um, so I've got two videos to come on the Splitter because the Splitter is such a powerful tool. I can't just do one video that just kind of does a little bit of an overview, which it, which it has done and, you know, it's been useful. Um, it's got a lot of views. So um, I'm definitely going to do a couple more videos um, looking at some of the other features and functionality of the split function. That, I think, would be really, really cool for everybody. Uh, and then I've got more videos lined up throughout the course of the year. Plan is to have a video every week. And as you can hear, I have a little bit of a cold as well, which is great fun. Mika asks, do your children go to that school? Yes, they do. Uh, what a trauma for the kids. Who go to that school? Yes, it is. It's it's been a heck of a trauma, especially for those that were in the after school club who had to be evacuated, and they they would have seen the smoke and the fire and everything else. My kids didn't get to see that. Um, it was I only knew about it because um my kids have we can the the attic is converted upstairs, so um our kids have the whole of the attic space to themselves, and so there's a wi there's obviously windows in the roof, so. They, they looked out the window and they could see the smoke and the fire from the school because we, we only live about eight minutes away from the school. So they could see the smoke and the fire. And they came hurtling down the stairs, screaming and shouting, saying, the school's on fire, the school's on fire. And she's like, what? Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, let's see. Ken says priorities, we certainly understand. Thank you very much, Ken. I appreciate that. Uh, Mika says, there are many schools in South Florida that have had temporary classrooms since Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Wow. Still got temporary classrooms all these years later. That's, that's crazy. I certainly think that it will be a lot less time before a new school is built um, for, for the kids of Liberton, which is where we live. It's a it's a suburb. Um, is it a suburb? I suppose it is. It's kind of on the southeast outskirts of Edinburgh. Um, so we are technically in Edinburgh, but um, we're actually very close to the city bypass. And so yeah, um, we are technically Edinburgh still. Bob says, I have a feeling that if it was my school, my class, and I would have cheered. <laughs> you know what? I'm pretty sure that there were some kids, and maybe even one or two staff members, that did do that. Um, it's quite an old building. Um, it's I think it's a 1950s, 1960s building. Um, so... There are issues there as well, like asbestos and things like that, that are present in that building, which probably qualify it for being flattened. Uh, the interesting thing is, and probably the sad thing about this, is that um, 
some of the classrooms were undergoing a refit, so they're having new windows put in, new carpets, and and everything else put in, uh, because you know it's an old school and they it just needed dragging, kicking, and screaming into the twenty first century. So that was all ongoing, and uh, it's thought that quite possibly the fire was an electrical fire to start with. So that's kind of the story with that. But that's not what we're here for, really. But I thought, you know, I'd fill you in on what's going on here. So yeah, been a bit, been a bit of a troubling week and a bit of an unsettling week, and I've not managed to achieve very much, <laughs> which is a bit of a pain. But anyway, that is that. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I thought we'd talk about what motivates you to get into your studio and make some music. What motivates you? What stirs you? What gets you? What gets you going? Are you one of these people that's really practical and has to, and, and schedules time in your studio that you go, you know, maybe you have a day job and maybe your studio time is on a Friday night. So you have that blocked out in your schedule, in your either in your mind or on a calendar for, for everyone in your family to see. Um, what motivates you? What gets you going to go and make music in your studio? How do you get and make the most of your time that you have in your studio? Now, I know some of the folks here that are regulars in the, in the show here, being in the studio is your day job. So, you know, like it is for me, being in my studio is my day job. I'm in here every, every single day for at least 16, 17 hours in a day. So, um, what motivates me? What keeps me going? What keeps me making sure that I make the best use of those 16 hours rather than wasting time? Um, well, I have to, for me, I have to schedule everything, or at least that's what I try to do. I try to schedule everything. So um, I try to plan what I'm going to achieve over the course of a week, uh, and it goes into my calendar. So I know what I'm doing on Monday, I know what I'm doing on Tuesday, I know what I'm doing on Wednesday, and so on and so forth. So that by the time I get to the end of the week, um, you know, I can look back and, and go, okay, yes, I did achieve that. Yes, I did achieve that. Yes, I did achieve that. But I took longer than I should have over that. And then I can go, okay, why did I take longer over that than I should? And most of the time I can put it down to, I just wasn't very productive, or I just didn't you know, I got too easily distracted by other things. And there are things to distract you, seriously. Even in a, even if uh, you have like a very dedicated studio space, and maybe your computer that you do your studio work on is not even connected to the internet. That can help, because that means you have got rid of the distractions of Google, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all of that stuff. That can be a massive distraction. Unfortunately for me, I need to be connected to the internet because Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, all of those are part of what I do. <laughs> they are a, a big part of how I run my business. So um, now my business could absolutely survive without those things, but it is made easier by, by making use of social media um, for what I do. Uh, let's see. Uh, have they figured out how it started? Yes, they think it was an electrical fire. But it's still being investigated, so we'll probably know more at the start of this week, I would think. Uh, Bob says, I have a song in my head, then I feel the need to start putting it down. No time to schedule. Helps when my wife is out of town like this weekend, working on a song all weekend. Awesome, that's great. Those kind of times when you know that you're going to be home alone for the weekend. Those are precious. So, yeah, you need to be able to get into your studio and have that time where you just you just work on your music, unhindered, unfettered, and minimal distractions. 
and making the best use of your time. That's always the hard bit. Um, you know, I, I sometimes my wife and kids will go through to um, uh, my wife's parents' place in Glasgow, and I'll be like, great, I'm on my own for the weekend. Um, and so that means, heck, I've got all of this time, loads of time, the whole weekend to just kind of do what I want to do in here. Um, and even then, you know, it can be, it can be hard to be productive. I can be very easily distracted. That's probably my biggest weakness is too easily distracted. <laughs> uh, Ken says, I'm a weekend warrior, but my kids in sports and family activities typically take away from that. Yeah, so for, for those of you that have like a day, um, a, you know, Monday to Friday day job, and so the weekends are your precious studio time, um, and, you know, having wife and kids, yeah, that, that can, you know, that can narrow that window from, hey, I've got quite a lot of the weekend to do something, to I've maybe only got a couple of hours on a Saturday night, at best, and that could get wiped out at any time. So, you know, for, for you guys that only have like a couple of hours per week, you need to really make sure that you make the most of those two hours per week so that you get maximum, um, uh, maximum productivity out of that time. Um, so it might, it might well be what helps you. Oh, wow, that was loud in my ears. Notifications. I always forget to turn notifications off. Because on Windows 7, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> uh, and I'm still not quite used to Windows 10. Um, I'll figure out how to do that. <laughs> Excuse me, you did not need to hear me snort. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so, you know, for those of you that only have literally two hours per week, you need to plan out what you're going to do for those two hours so that you, so that you know that your two hours are going to be used to the, to the, you know, to the highest possible quality and uh, that you can, and productivity that you can, so that, you know, you make the best out of those two hours. Uh, let's see, Mika says, I was recording a five-piece band this weekend, they play Kid Charlemagne, possibly better than the Dan, no way. <laughs> Nobody can play it better than Steely Dan. <laughs> you know, it is their song after all, but, <laughs> but to hear it played really, really, really well, yeah, there are there are lots of tribute Steely Dan bands out there. In fact, there are some in the UK that are really really good. Um, who they're okay. <laughs> Their performances are okay. They're not, you know, they're not maybe the best, but they are okay. Um, but yeah, if you've got a great bunch of musicians that have serious chops and talent and performing skills then yeah that you can you can pull out a really really top quality performance out of students like that out of um musicians like that um kid charlemagne's a great song <laughs> uh i used to play that in with my band that was among several steely dan songs we did we did maybe four or five steely dan songs we did some tower of power we did some uh weather reports uh, to give my voice a rest, and we did uh, some Stevie Wonder. Um, I seem to recall at least a couple of times we did a couple of Donny Hathaway songs. Um, what else did we do? We did some Earth, Wind & Fire songs. Uh, yeah, that was kind of the stuff that I did with my band for like 23 years, 24 years. Uh, Great fun, uh, and I would play piano and sing. Uh, and I it started out as a twelve piece band, and gradually, after the the um, the financial crash of two thousand eight, after all that happened, um, venues started being a little bit tighter with their money and what they would pay for a for a band to play um, their venue. And my band gradually got smaller and smaller and smaller until for maybe the last. 10 years, eight years, last eight years, uh, it was just three of us. <laughs> Still playing the same songs, mind, but there was only, you know, three of us. 
it was um so we we relied as we got smaller we relied a lot on um integrating midi and that kind of thing to augment the sound uh you know i'd, I'd do some backing tracks here in the studio um and then we would play so like i would do horn tracks and things like that in the studio here so um the things that we were missing after i had to get rid of the horn section um we could still have those integrated into the sound even though there are only three of us so we had to work with click tracks a lot uh let's see um Raina says my motivation to make music is the inspiration and ideas that come with life and emotions and what's happening around me yeah uh I would say, you know, things like what have happened this last week ought to shape maybe some songwriting. Um, yeah. Need to think about that. But yeah, that's true. Bob says, ironically, I've moved away from guitar-based music, been focusing on piano and strings for the new song. That's a really good point, actually, Bob. You know, a good way to change up what you do in your studio is to change up how you do it. So, you know, if your standard songwriting um, process is you sit down with your acoustic guitar and you strum a few chords until you find a set of chord changes that you really like, and then you start humming a melody until a melody starts to form, um, and then you start, you know, kind of spitballing some wor words around... <coughs> You know, if that's your stand, if that's your, you know, kind of your method, sometimes it's a good idea to change that up and go, okay, for this song, I'm not going to use my acoustic guitar. I'm going to use a keyboard. Or maybe the next, maybe you decide, hey, I'm actually going to start with drum loops. That's another good way to change up your methodology. Uh, and by doing that, you can really open up. Um, a whole other way of doing things that you'd never maybe thought of before. Um, so that can really work. I've, I've done that um, a few times in the past where, you know, I'm just like, okay, this is my standard methodology, but what if I change it up? What if I move away from how I do, how I write my songs and try a different way of doing it? Uh, and, you know, that can actually lead to something far more creative than you ever really thought of before um so that's a good that's a good point mika says they were not copying it they were doing their own extremely hot version with some interesting atonal interplay interesting cool okay that sounds that sounds great um that kind of stuff i love a bit of atonality especially when you are playing atonal in the context of tonal music i like doing that and I do, I do that with quite a lot of my improvisation as well. Uh, Ken Moss says, we cover a version of Dirty Work. That's a, Dirty Work is a great song. It's hilarious as well. Really, really well written song. Um, uh, decent version, but we don't have a sax. Yeah, there's quite a nice sax solo in that song. Mike Neighbor is here. He says, hello all, just popping in real quick. Hi Mike, good to see you buddy. And good to see, actually, folks, pay attention. Whoops, smack the mic. Pay attention to my friend, Mike Neighbor, and what he's doing at the moment, because he is being really, really creative in his studio at the moment with, um, uh, you know, he's, he's hit upon a methodology and a way of working uh, and uh, as a, a genre of working in that seems to be really, really working for him and has really kind of just opened the floodgates of creativity for him. So, um, Mike, please do continue to share with us um, the work that you're doing, because, um, you know, to those that are, are finding that they are struggling with being creative in their studios and, um, you know, getting somewhere, releasing music, getting music out there, um, what Mike is doing is really, really good. Really, really great. I have to commend him a lot because he has worked really hard at pushing against this wall because, you know, there, there are periods in our creative cycles where we reach a wall and we're just banging our heads up against that wall 
and you know not really getting anywhere a lot of people a lot of people give up at that point they go oh, okay maybe this is not for me and sometimes i've done that sometimes i've even said that okay maybe this is not for me maybe i just need to go and get a regular job you know i've i've hit that wall a few times uh but usually when i get to that point where i'm saying maybe this isn't for me after all maybe i've just wasted my entire life uh and you know the whole thing has just been a massive misdirection uh and i hit that wall and you know it usually takes saying something like that to yourself to motivate yourself to push through it and mike has done that mike has pushed through that wall and very often very very often when you push through that wall you find a rich vein of creativity is lying on the other side of that wall waiting for you to tap into it and that is what's happened for mike so i think mike has a really encouraging story um that can really help us really help all of us myself included um to push through when you hit that when you hit that wall of creativity push through it mike has done that and it's not been easy for him to do it because you know i think maybe his natural inclination would be to say hey maybe this just isn't for me and i need to do something else um but he has persevered and a large portion of of getting anywhere in any creative art in any craft is perseverance i'd say that's about 90% of getting anywhere in music uh is perseverance is hanging tough digging in deep and you know not giving up even when it's really really tempting to do it so mike big 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 props to you um let's see bob says it does show shortcomings and unexpected surprises playing a keyboard and trying th- trying new things and sounds at um out of my comfort zone for sure enjoying the process though that's a, another really good thing actually about you know kind of going outside of your comfort zone uh and again mike has done this recently gone outside of his comfort zone explored an entirely different an entirely different a uh, way of of making music and it's really worked for him it's really opened opened him up in a way that i think he probably you know 12 months ago would never really thought of um but yeah having limitations you know a lot of people think limitations inhibit creativity actually they do the opposite they give you reason to explore those boundary edges so maybe you don't have the greatest piano chops because maybe it's an instrument that you don't really play a lot maybe you know your main thing is guitar or maybe your main thing is bass or maybe your main thing is trumpet or saxophone or something like that perhaps or maybe you're a vocalist and that's what you do and you or maybe you're just a mix guy and you've never really thought about you know writing a song you you maybe thought hey that's just not something i can do well you know what the people in this chat here should teach you the exploring those kind of areas okay you may find out songwriting's not for me but you'll never know for sure unless you actually go and give it a shot and on the other hand you might just open up a whole new world of creativity within music that that is that surprises you you know you never know you never know what can happen i never thought i could write songs for other people other than me i thought the only way that i write songs is songs that i can sing songs that are in my range my register um songs that that you know use a harmonic palette that is uniquely mine that i like but you know one of the challenges i've had over the years um presented to me is to write for other for other vocalists and i've done that a few i've done that a lot now but the whole first couple of times i was just like no i can only write for me i only write songs that i can sing 
I don't write for other people. Just can't do it. Won't do it, in fact, was kind of where I was. Won't do it. Well, <laughs> when I got the chance to write for somebody here in the UK who is actually, you know, fairly successful in the music business here in the UK, not going to mention any names, um, and uh, she asked me to, to write for her. She, she gave me a, a blank piece of paper. She said I could, you know, write anything, write what, you know, write what you feel. Um, and so I did. And I found that I had to listen a lot to her previous recordings. And um, I had to listen a lot to songs that had, had already been written for her by other songwriters. Um, so that I could figure out kind of what her limitations are, where she sounds best, you know, the sweet spot of her register, the sweet, the, her sweet spot stylistically, um, and how best to write the arrangement of the song to really bring out the best in her voice and to really draw the best performance out of her. And um, the, to me, all of those were limitations because I was used to just writing for me and doing what I do. You know, for me, no walls. But now I had boundaries. Now I had somebody else's vocal register. Now I had somebody else's style that I had to consider and somebody else's approach to a song to consider. And I had to think about the best the best way to get the best out of this vocalist in a way that's going to make her shine uh, and to, to write about subject matters that she would be able to deliver, that she would be able to, to sell. And that those were all limitations and challenges for me that I never thought I could ever do until I did it once with this, with this particular artist. And I wrote a song for her and I thought it was rubbish. I'll be really honest, I thought it was rubbish. I thought it was awful. I thought it was the worst song I've ever written. She's not going to like it. She's not even going to record it. She'll just kind of go, yeah, okay, thanks. That's that. And she would, you know, settle up the balance of, of payment for that, for that work, and that would be that. Not only did she record, not only did she like it, but she recorded it. And she went on tour around the UK with it. And a lot of other people liked it. <laughs> and that record sold actually reasonably well, actually. To the point where she said, okay, that went well. Let's do another one. So we did. And I ended up writing a lot of songs for her, actually, over the years. Uh... And um, I learned something. i tell you what I learned the most. I learned not just how to write songs better, but I learned how to write for a particular voice, for a particular person. And then I started going back through my old record collection and listening to Duke Ellington and realizing that Duke Ellington, when he wrote his charts for his band, he wasn't writing, he wasn't just writing music. He was writing to get the best out of each individual instrumentalist in his band. So he would voice the trumpets in a way that would get the best out of all four of his trumpet players. And the same for the trombones, and the same for the saxes. The same thing. And I realized that that's how he wrote, and that's why I loved his music, because his music wasn't just about showing off his... Uh, his compositional arranging skills, he actually used this, the sound of each of his musicians in his band as his palette. And I thought, that's it. And, it. and I tell you, once that light bulb went off for me, it opened up a massive, massive, massive vein of creativity for me. Uh, and I... I, I th I have never been the same since. I'll tell you that. Bobby says... Bobby Booth is here. Hey, Bobby. He says, just made it to the top 10 over in in this contest for Studio One Sessions. Awesome! 
Bobby Booth is a really, really good mix engineer. If you have never heard his mixing, you should go and check out some of the mixes he's done in the uh, Studio One Sessions group contests, which he has won. He has won, I think you've won, what, two or three now, Bobby, is it? I can't quite remember. Yeah, I can't quite remember whether it's two or three that you've won. And I know that you've won other mixing contests as well. He's got some serious mixing chops, guys. So, you know, if you want somebody to mix your songs, go to Bobby Booth. Yeah, you could hire me or you could hire Johnny or you could hire Dave Vignola. But definitely, I, I completely, wholeheartedly recommend Bobby. Um, he will do a great job with your with your songs. Uh, and the cool thing about Bobby is that he, he will try and and work with different styles and different genres that he is totally unfamiliar with. Um, and he'll do a really good job, even with his, even with, you know, with unfamiliarity with the style and how to, um, and how to work in that particular style and, and kind of how you EQ, how you compress the audio sources differently for different styles. So even if he's working with a mix that is in a style he, he, he's not familiar with, he does a really good job. Uh, and he, you know, that's something else that he can, he can now put away, put a tick on the box. I've mixed in this style and I learned X, Y, and Z. So Bobby Booth, uh, is a really, really talented guy. Go check out what he does. Michael Johnson says, what is the easiest or best way you found to monitor LUFS in Studio One? Say I want to target, target minus 14 LUFS for a particular export of a song. Very good question. Um, and for this, I am going to open up Studio One. And I snorted again. Sorry, folks. <laughs> and I'm going to show you something. I'm just waiting for Studio One to, to load up. And I'm going to show you how you can get LUFS in uh, the Studio One song page, because you can already get it in the project page. But if you want to have LUFS monitoring in the song page, you can do it. Um, you just need to know how to do it. Now, you could go and get a third party plugin to do it. And there are many that will do it. The one that I, that I would most recommend is the um, the loudness penalty plugin from uh, Ian Shepard, made by Meter Plugs, I believe, is the company that makes them. Um, but yes, I wholeheartedly recommend that plugin from my good friend Ian Shepard. Not just because he's a friend of mine, but because um, he is one of the leading lights in combating the loudness wars, and has pioneered such events as the dynamic dynamic range day and stuff like that. He is, he's a great guy, but I really, really recommend you go and uh, check, check out that. It's very reasonably priced as well. All right. So here we are, we're in studio one and what you can do is you can go to your effects tab. You don't need to see all of my files and you can scroll all the way down with your mouse wheel, or you can just grab this. And what you're looking for, I believe, uh, where is it? Is the level meter, this guy here. Slap that onto your master bus. And uh, which one is it? Is it this one here? Yes. So if you click the R128, which is the EBU R128, which is the European Broadcasters Union um, loudness metering standard. So uh, radio stations, TV stations in Europe have to have their audio conforming to this um, R128 standard. Um, and there are different loudness standards um, around the world now. So the United States has one, Japan has one that, that covers Australasia, um, and uh, the UK and Europe um, adhere to EBU R128, although now that the UK has left the European Union, this might change. <laughs> I hope it doesn't, but it might. So, uh, when you click the R128, you have different options here. You have EBU plus 18 scale, or you have um, LU scale or LUFS scale. So what is LU? LU is loudness unit. It is a unit of measurement of loudness. 
okay? 1 LU is equivalent to 1 dB. And then LUFS, this one here, is loudness unit as it relates to full scale. That's what FS stands for, full scale. Loudness units, full scale. And so when you play your music, it gives you all of this information here. If I just mute the output of Studio One for a minute so I can talk over this. Um, so it shows you your output according to this um, loudness units scale, which tops out at uh, minus 14 at the top here. Um, so yes, yeah, so you have this little gap between minus 20 and then minus 14. Now if you hover your line over here, it gives you in this little, do you see this little box here? It gives you um, the dB, then it gives you the integrated loudness, and then the range in LU, which, and, um, which is the short-term momentary loudness, and then the LUFS is kind of like the overall loudness. And then so you get all of these all of this data here. So there's your integrated, there's your range, um, the loudness range from the quietest moment to the loudest moment is 8.1 LUs. And then you've got your short term and then your momentary loudness. So that's always constantly changing every moment. And then this is your short term figure. And then there's your true peak value there. So the, the highest peak at the moment is minus just short of minus 5 dB. Um, and my integrated loudness is sitting at minus 23 LUFS. So if I wanted to target minus 14, then I need to, tu I need to turn up um, this song entirely. Now obviously, there's no mixing done on this yet at all. Um, so I have no inserts, I have no EQ, I have no compression, I have no limiting or anything else like that going on. Uh, it's not even gain stage, for goodness sake. So, um, this red box here shows you your target window, if you like, or kind of where your loudness um, is sat at the moment, your loudness range is sat. And you want that to kind of sit up here to minus 14, that kind of area. Uh, and then, of course, you can, you can constantly reset. So it creates um, a new box and a new... Um, line as well, um, but you've also you can al always measure this in true peak as well, which is kind of that's the standard metering for um, the output of the the main fader here. Um, but you've also got um, K metering scale, so I use K twenty for mixing, and I'll use K fourteen for mastering as well. And I'm aiming to kind of hit the zero area uh, on both scales, so. Now we're just kind of pushing a little bit over, this, occasionally peeking over the zero area of the K20 metering. Uh, and then, you know, for kind of more broadcast orientated, so if, if I'm doing like um, a podcast or something, I might do this to uh, K12. Uh, and that gives you like 12 dB of headroom. This gives you 14 dB of headroom. This gives you 20 dB of headroom. Uh, and by, by using these... Um, uh, metering settings, uh, I basically have not clipped the master bus in years. It just doesn't happen for me anymore. So there you go. So that's how you, you target that. You have this in R128 mode, and this gives you your LUFS here. So you're wanting this to kind of be around about minus 13 to minus 14, this number here, this integrated loudness number. Um, so, yes. And my good friend Ian Shepard on his website, productionadvice.co.uk, has loads and loads and loads of stuff on LUFS and the case scale and um, loudness metering, loudness management. He has all of that on his site. And he has articles, he's got videos, he's got all sorts of stuff that will teach you everything you possibly need to know about this. So I hope that that helps. I'm going to unmute that now. And we'll close that. So I hope that that helps, uh, Michael. And we'll go back over to this screen here. I hope that helps. 
Let's see. Mike Neighbor says, On a happy note, I am finally quitting my second job tomorrow, which will make even more free time for family and music. That is awesome, Michael. I am very pleased to hear that, buddy. Because uh, you and I have been talking that, talking about that for a wee while. Uh, Ken Moss said, That's how Mancini wrote Moon River, made sure the notes were in Audrey Hepburn's range. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's see. Bobby says, I have been in the top 10 about 30 times. Well, there you go. That shows your caliber as a mix engineer, my friend. Rich says, what is LUFS? Well, I hope I have just explained what LUFS is. Bob says, if LUFS are different in different areas, does the musical audio of TV movies need to be changed according to what region it's going to? No, and I'll tell you why. Because the overall... Uh, output, if you like, the, the the net result of the different standards is that most of the world conforms to minus 14 LUFS, minus 14 dB LUFS, some it's minus 13. So there's only like one dB different. So if you were to target minus 14, you'd be fine, because even in those areas where um, it is set for minus 13, you, you know, your music's only going to be turned down by 1 dB. So you'll only you lose 1 dB of dynamic range. That's it. So you don't need to do, like, a different master for for Australasia, a different master for the United States, and a different master for Europe. It doesn't really work quite like that. Um, the standards are all really, really similar. They just have a different a different name to them, like, you know, um, EBUR-128 is an accord between all of the broadcasting um, uh, groups, bodies, whatever you want to call them, uh, across the, the European Union. So they have a body called the um, European Broadcasters Union. And uh, so you have radio stations and TV stations that are all a part of this EBU. And uh, they came up with a loudness management standard that means all of their audio output for radio and TV and movies in the European Union conforms to this standard. And it just means that that's the end of the loudness wars, guys. There's no point in, in crushing your mix to death to try and make it as loud as possible. See, music is designed to have dynamics. It always was. That's what makes music interesting. That's what makes music engaging for your ears. Is that it has dynamic range. You know, listen to any Beethoven symphony and you will hear that there is a massive dynamic range. It's huge. It can go from thunderously loud to barely audible. And Beethoven explores that whole dynamic range. And that's what makes his music totally absorbing and engaging. Because when the music is really, really quiet, you have to really zero in your ears to hear that. It may well be that there's just like a couple of piccolos and a flute playing a little figure, and it's, that's being answered by an oboe and a, and a bass clarinet or something like that. Except Beethoven wouldn't have had bass clarinets, certainly not early on, maybe later on. Um, but, you know, and then the next thing that can happen, maybe eight bars later, is the whole orchestra is in with the whole percussion section as well. And they're all playing at full blast, as loud as they can possibly play. And so, you know, that's what keeps the listener engaged in a 40-minute work. Because most people's attention span is only... 45 seconds at best. So, how do you keep an audience sitting there listening to your music for 40 minutes? You either do it with orchestration, you either do it with introducing um, different motifs and different um, uh, counter melodies, key changes, you know, so you either do it with changes in orchestration or changes in the arrangement, or you do it with dynamics, or you 
even better. You do it with all three. You know, what makes some of the best songs some of the best songs? Why are they completely compelling from the start to finish? It's because all of those things are in place. There are dynamics. There are there's an interesting orchestration. There are different melodic um, ideas and concepts. There are counter melodies. There are interesting chord changes. The orchestration is interesting. The melody is really compelling and has a really solid hook. And then, of course, there's the, the, the narrative, the lyrics. You know, all of those things come together to combine to make something that is compelling from bar one, beat one to the very end of the song. So music is meant to have dynamics. Um, and it's just annoying that some of the best songs um, I have heard have then been remastered. And when they've been remastered, they have been squashed to death. And all the di all of the dynamics have been sucked out of them, and all you have is just loud. Start to finish, loud. Four minutes of loud. That's really, really fatiguing on your ears. And it's no wonder that, you know, kids today will skip to the next song after about 15 seconds. Because the ears become disengaged by just loud, one dynamic. You just, you just get completely bleh, disengaged. Make your music interesting, not just loud. <laughs> there, ran over. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ken says you can take the loudness meter and stretch it up vertically, and if you resize the studio one window just a bit from the right side, place a big LUFS meter on the side of your screen. That's that is exactly true, and Joe Gilder has made a video all about that on the Presonus uh, YouTube channel. You can go check that out. Um, it's a very cool thing to do if you want to have really, really crystal clear metering on just on all the time. You can pin it. You can use the, the, the pin feature on all of the Studio One plugins, and you can just have it pinned to the side of the screen, and you've got this massive meter, which is great. It's a good idea. Uh, Frank is here. Frank Wagner. Hello. Speaking of loudness, illegal for a commercial volume to exceed the average volume of the channel. What a joke. Uh, yeah. It is illegal. Very, very hard to police, though. <laughs> but yes, very true. Uh, Mike Johnson says, for the Bobcats K system, I usually go for K14. Yes, there you go. Uh, Mike Neighbors says, Ian's website is awesome. It truly is. Uh, James Geo says, why the variance between LUFS and K20? K20 looked good, but LUFS was low. It's because they are measuring two completely different things. Uh, and they are measuring on two different scales completely. So don't be put off with the meter being over here on one scale and the meter being over here on another scale. It's they are measuring two different things. It's like the difference between measuring a fluid in fluid ounces versus milliliters. It's going to be the same volume of, of fluid, but it will look different on a different scale. So on one scale, it'll look like a lot. On another scale, it might look like a lot less. So, you know, don't be put off by such things. Uh, let's see, Fam family game time, good night to all. Mike Neighbor, that is a really, really good thing, so um, definitely go and enjoy that. Uh, Michael Johnson says, thank you for showing me those options in the level meter. You're welcome. Uh, Snidely is here, hello mate. He says, that's what makes music passionate. Absolutely, and that's why the Romantic Period was called the Romantic Period. It has... <laughs> You know, it has nothing to do with Mills and, Boone's, Mills and Boone's novels, The Romantic Period. But what it does do is The Romantic Period explored an expanded harmonic palette, an expanded melodic palette, and a much bigger dynamic range than Mozart and Handel 
um, and you know the the classical period composers explored. Now Mozart was beginning to head in that direction with some of his later symphonies and some of his later operas, actually, um, like some of like uh, Don Giovanni, for example, has actually a surprisingly large dynamic range and actually is really quite advanced harmonically, certainly more than more advanced harmonically than a lot of his contemporaries. Um, uh, and he, you know, he explored taking uh, upper intervals of a chord and using those as a melody um, and introducing dissonances. And uh, he would always resolve his dissonances, almost in, sometimes almost instantly resolve his dissonances, but they were always there. He was always borrowing notes from other keys that, you know, don't belong. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of ways in which Mozart, particularly later period Mozart, um, was really beginning to push the boundaries of of things harmonically and um, melodically and orchestrationally as well. I mean, the orchestra for uh, symph symphonic works, symphony works, which is, by the way, symphony is largely um, a form that we owe a massive debt of gratitude to Mozart for, because he pretty much pioneered it and developed it almost single-handedly. Um, it didn't really massively exist before Mozart. Uh, Mozart made this, the, the form uh, what it is. And of course, all of these hundreds of years later, it's still a great form for writing uh, orchestral works in and you know even composers today like John Williams will make use of it so there you go uh, let's see um, Karloff o Fortuna, uh, o Fortuna is a great example yes it most certainly is I totally agree there uh, Mike Johnson says, might be good to try and explain which systems are more of a perceived loudness versus peak um, RMS and that kind of stuff. Yes, I will do a video on that, actually. I don't think I've actually done a video on those kind of things, so I think maybe I will do that. I will make a note. Frank says, take care, everyone. Um, Johnny's hope the... Hope the best for your children's school. Thank you very much, mate. And uh, we are pretty much out of time. And you guys have asked some great questions there about loudness and all of that and dynamics and music. That's really great. We've had a great conversation tonight. Uh, so thank you for the great questions. And as always, if you are not a subscriber to my email list, please, please, please go over to johnnylipstrandstudios.co.uk. When you arrive at the website, right at the top there, there's a red button that says get my free course now. Hit that red button. You will get onto my email list and you'll get two things. The first thing you'll get is you'll get my brand new free compression course. I have given away a compression course for the last several years. Well, I, I completely redid it. I rewrote it. Um, so it's a brand new compression course updated for 2019-2020. Uh, uh, so you can go and get your hands on that, and you'll also, uh, so the first email that you get will get you in to my email list, and then you'll get another email granting you an offer to um, my VIP community, which you can also, you will also, you, you will just get that. So um, when you get that, click through that email, and that will take you to my forum, and there are some topics there that you can go and, and, and get involved in. And I would love it, guys, if we really grew that forum community. That'd be really, really cool. I have plans to do... Uh, it's a com at the moment, it's a completely free forum, okay? It's, at the moment, completely free. I don't think I'm going to be charging for it, at least not yet. Um, but yes... It's completely free. You guys can go in and get in there. Um, and there's some topics there. There's a topic for each of my new courses, my songwriting course and my music theory course. So if you've got any feedback about those courses, if you have purchased those, please do leave your feedback in those um, uh, forum threads as well. That would help me um, 
make the next videos because they are beginner courses at the moment but i'm going to do an intermediate one for each the songwriting and the uh music theory course they're going to get an intermediate video later this year and then towards the end of this year around about the kind of christmas time the advanced courses will be released for both of those so you'll have three courses for songwriting three courses for um music theory and then in 2021 um i have some arranging courses that i'm going to be releasing as well so there'll be horn arranging rhythm section arranging vocal harmony arranging string arranging those um courses are going to be um released throughout of 2021 and uh hopefully there will be courses there that you can all get your teeth into and uh get learning from i have a load of stuff that i want to get out there to you guys get into your hands uh all of my courses at the moment retail for 26 pounds each which i think is around about 20 at the moment i think it's around about 24 dollars i think so they are really 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 low priced um but you get a load of stuff you get all the videos and you get some other content as well bundled with those so go and get those courses and go and get your free course more importantly and uh, get yourself in that vip community that would be awesome if you could do that that'd be great go and uh, go over to johnny studios.co.uk the web address is right below my finger somewhere down there you can see that there go and uh, get that into your browser and uh, go and get your free course and go and have a look at the library of the other courses as well that'd be great and I will see you guys on Wednesday for Songwriting Simplified over at Johnny Gives' channel. So until then, folks, I will bid you a very... Hang on, I'm not even ready to say this yet. <laughs> I'll bid you guys a very good night, and I will see you on Wednesday. Bye for now. Good night, everybody.